Hi, how you doing? How's your day been? Oh, interesting. So here's something to consider. I, the person currently speaking to you and flagrantly encouraging parasociality, am not really here. I mean, I'm somewhere, probably napping or thinking about space, but I'm not here right now speaking to you. What you're seeing is a form of recorded communication saved to a storage device somewhere in YouTube servers before being accessed and replayed by whatever cell phone, tablet, computer, or TV set you're currently looking at. And that's just one of the many forms of extremely impressive high-tech telecommunication we've gotten totally used to despite that being absolutely wild when you think about it. The words I said in a cozy recording booth weeks or months or even years ago have been wound up and frozen in time by a large amount of extremely complicated technology latticed across thousands of miles with a chain of developmental history reaching back centuries, and then you pressed play and set them on spooling, creating the illusion of communication even though you and I are nowhere near each other in space or in time. Of course, there's a reason we aren't constantly losing our minds about the wondrous technological advancements that surround us. Normalcy is a completely relative concept, and people are extremely good at adapting to new developments and absorbing them into their concept of normal. If you've lived with something for long enough, it becomes an established fact of your reality, and you see it as normal and thus not worth thinking about too hard, no matter how buckwild it might actually be on closer examination. But because of how good we are at seeing things as normal, it's actually very useful to sometimes take a step back and look at the world around us with fresh eyes, to see what factors are invisibly shaping our lives, and perhaps even examine how they came to be the way that they are. The way we think about ourselves and the people around us is strongly affected by the social and technological landscape we inhabit, and as new things enter those spaces and then become normal and thus invisible, we can be changed without even noticing it. For instance, have you noticed how many stories have magic cell phones now? Let me explain. Communication is a crucial element of storytelling, not just on a meta level in that all storytelling is technically a form of communication from the teller to the audience, but within the structure of the story, characters being able or unable to communicate is a huge factor on the plot. Most obviously, miscommunication plots naturally rely on the characters having an imperfect mode of communication with each other, mishearing or misunderstanding or only getting a fraction of the information they need. Dramatic irony is a meta trope that relies on the audience having information that the characters don't, frequently resulting in situations where the audience is rooting for the characters to communicate that information with each other and stop acting unwisely based on their incomplete knowledge. Overall, a lot of plots rely on the characters having incomplete information about the story they're in, and one way to facilitate this is to limit the amount of information those characters can communicate to each other. And of course, there's a lot of drama to be derived from characters trying to find people. If someone's gone missing or been captured or injured, the drama comes from trying to find and retrieve them when they naturally can't communicate where they are. Stress and fear can be provoked if the characters don't know for sure that another character is alright or even if they're alive. And all of this hinges on the characters being unable to perfectly communicate at all times. And fortunately for the writers, just like in real life, if the characters aren't physically right next to each other or broadly within earshot, it's generally expected that they won't be able to communicate without the use of some form of long-distance communication technology. And if they don't have that, they'll be out of communication until they can get back in the same place. Thus, it's extremely easy to facilitate miscommunication or limited information plots because the characters just need to be physically separated. When characters are out of communication, they by necessity act in isolation since they can't coordinate coordinate with each other. They don't know for sure what the other character's situation is or what they're doing, and a lot of drama can result from that. Like if the backup gets ambushed or someone gets betrayed at a crucial moment and nobody realizes till the plan's already halfway fallen apart. So many plots have been facilitated by characters not being able to call for help or contact authorities. As a rule, in most standard story structures, unless a character explicitly has an ability or technology that'll allow them to send a message long distance, characters are expected to be isolated unless they are physically in the presence of their allies. And for the vast majority of human history, this was normal. Normal. This was the expected state of being. Unless someone was actively choosing to be in communication with someone else, they were alone. But normal has changed. The march of progress in telecommunications technology has incremented our concept of what level of communication is normal. It's impossible to find reliable statistics on how many people in the world have access to cell phones and cell networks, trust me, I tried. But at the bare minimum, we know it's more people than have ever had access to cell phones before. On top of that, the wide array of messenger apps and programs and sites makes it possible for almost any modern device to chat with any other. So a desktop computer can chat with a cell phone, can chat with a tablet, no problem, giving people even more ways to stay in contact contact regardless of what specific device they might have access to. And of course, if you have an iPhone, you can text somebody with an Android, etc, etc. The world is more connected than it has ever been, and that invisible paradigm is reflected in the stories we tell, even the ones set in fantastical other worlds or spec-fic futures. When it comes to communication, the assumed state of normalcy has reversed. Before, being able to contact somebody was a deviation from the norm. You had to send a letter or a telegram or a phone call or an email, and they had to be in the right place or at the right time to receive it. Now we tend to assume that 
that if we can't get in contact with somebody almost immediately, something is wrong. Maybe their battery died, or they're stuck somewhere with no reception, or their phone was destroyed, or they're out of commission and can't answer. A million things could have gone wrong to knock them off the grid, but that's only worrying to us because the assumption is that they should be on the grid at all times. And modern stories have started to reflect that. Aside from stories set in the nominal present, where characters just have normal cell phones and use them as expected, there are tons of stories that contrive little bits of magic or tech to enable the characters to stay in almost constant communication over long distances. You got Leverage, which back in 2008 already had earbuds that are basically invisible hands-free phones. Young Justice kicked off the very first season in 2010 by giving the team a telepathic link maintained almost constantly by Ms. Martian that was basically a fancier group chat. The nominally historical low magic setting of Netflix's Castlevania adds magic mirrors in the second season that are basically used for FaceTime and, let's be honest, felt a little bit weird. 2018's She-Ra had Bo invent personal communicators that are basically iPads for video calls. In all of these settings, regardless of how fantastical they are, something can be contrived out of the magic or tech to allow for constant, instant communication between protagonists even when they're far away. And this is a reasonable development. After all, it's incredibly convenient for the writers and the characters, and since being out of communication is so risky and inconvenient, it makes sense that the characters would want to find a way to stay in touch. Through psychic powers or magic or gadgets made by tech geniuses, characters can keep each other updated on their current plans, find each other if they're missing, call for help when they're in a tight spot to enable dramatic rescues, and someone breaking communication can be a great way to facilitate instant drama. Not to mention, letting the villains coordinate over long distances can make it much easier to give the heroes trouble, so even if the heroes are fairly low-tech, giving the villains scrying technology or hologram phones or something is pretty classic stuff to contrive more complicated challenges for the good guys. In the history of literature and storytelling, bad guys got magic cell phones a lot earlier than good guys. Plus, if the writer wants to make it impossible for the characters to communicate, it's not hard to contrive something like a jammer or a psychic bad vibes field or something to temporarily cut off communication and force the characters to operate in isolation again, with the added tension that, since it's no longer the expected norm, they're not accustomed to it. It turns out giving your characters the ability to communicate instantly across long distances doesn't destroy the drama of limited contact or failure to communicate, it just changes the circumstances under which miscommunication or limited information plots happen. And frankly, I think a lot of this is just easier for modern writers, because at this point we're so used to being able to just text somebody for a quick update that it's hard to figure out how some of these story beats would work without that ability. The way we think about communication is on a level similar to muscle memory. So deeply ingrained, we don't even think about it in words. We want to check in with a friend, we reach for the phone and send a text. Well, what if we don't have the phone? What if the battery's dead? What if the reception's gone whack? Uh, panic? No, 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 that's dramatic. Of course there are other ways to reach them. But those ways require more thought, more information, and are less readily and immediately available. How many of us have memorized all our friends' mailing addresses, or even their phone numbers, when messenger apps are so much easier to habituate to? When chatting with a friend is as simple as type or dictate into pocket rectangle for a few seconds and then wait for it to go ding, the level of communication we take for granted becomes sky high. And as writers, if we're not careful, that reflects into our characters. But that's not a bad thing. It's not story breaking, it's just story changing. There's plenty of drama to be derived here. Everything from, has anyone heard from our teammate they went dark hours ago, to a character just really, really wanting to not answer the phone. And as long as the ability to link up the characters for long distance communication makes sense in setting, it's totally fine to let the characters magically text or psychically chat or whatever specific reskin we're using to make it fit the vibe. It makes sense that the characters would want to be able to do that. And conveniently, there are plenty of fictional methods for facilitating easy, constant, continuous communication. From magic mirrors, to comm links, to telepathic teammates, so we can just let the characters do that, no harm, no foul. It's easy. Hey, yeah, wait a second. If these stories have had that kind of plot device the whole time, how did we justify all those problems that could have been solved with the equivalent of a cell phone? Why didn't these solutions work back then? Or more accurately, why didn't we think of them sooner? Many of these magic cell phone stories are installments of long-running franchises that never used those powers or that technology that way before the mid to late 2000s. When 2010's Young Justice had McGann hook up everyone's brains for zero-effort psychic group calls, it made me question why they didn't do that in 2006's Legion of Superheroes, or 2001's Justice League, or 2000's X-Men Evolution, or any number of superhero stories where one of the protagonists is a powerful telepath and the team's inability to consistently communicate over long distances is a frequent source of frustration or difficulty. When the Star Wars prequels gave the Jedi tiny handheld comlinks and interplanetary hologram phone calls, it made me wonder why the entire plot of 1977's A New Hope hinges on a droid physically carrying a message through contested interplanetary space, and why in The Empire Strikes Back, Han Solo has to physically travel out into a snowstorm to find Luke before he 
he freezes because Luke has no way to signal or call for help. Now that we're so used to a level of ready, instant communication, when we see a story that hinges on characters that are able to do that, not doing it, we notice. The concept of a cell phone is not complicated by sci-fi standards. A small handheld device that allows for instantaneous audio communication with anyone else with a similar device that can optionally also instantaneously send and receive written messages. That is much less complicated, conceptually speaking, than a holodeck, and in fact has existed in fiction for a frankly shockingly long time. The first fictional wireless telephone is from 19 goddamn 14 in L. Frank Baum's TikTok of Oz, another frighteningly prescient prediction. And science fiction has always involved conceiving of speculative technology and then theorizing how its existence would alter the world and the society it integrates into. Not every sci-fi author tries to predict the future, but the genre's foundations are built on the concept of world-building futuristic visions. And on the fantasy side of things, the concept of a magic mirror or a crystal ball or psychic visions are much older than the technology that developed to reflect it. Many of these stories have always had the in-universe ability to facilitate basically texting, but most of them didn't. And as far as I can tell, none of them did it to the degree of universality that we've reached in real life. Some of these modern magic cell phones have been introduced into long-running settings, and despite the technology or magic involved being in-universe possible the whole time, the writers only started thinking to use it that way after their own lives were quietly changed by getting acclimated to the same technology. In the same way that it's frankly just easier for modern writers to give their main characters the equivalent of the level of communication they're personally used to, it was frankly easier for these older writers to do the same with their characters. Even if the writers lived in a world where the telegram was the new hotness, and the characters lived in a world with magic or psychic powers or wireless goddamn telephones! <sighs> Sorry, I still can't get over that. Oh my god. Anyway, we're fine. Everything's good. The world we live in has been very deeply changed by the communication tech we currently have. It's difficult to notice because of how normal it's become, but it's a fundamental shift in the way we think about people and our ability to stay in contact with them, which is a very fundamentally human thing. You know, humans are very social animals, to the point where just not speaking to other humans for a long enough time can start messing us up. I think it's very interesting that this has produced a shift in the way writers handle communication in fiction, and I think it's even more interesting that, as far as I can tell, nobody quite predicted it. Even when specfic writers conceived of a technology capable of doing what our current communication tech does, or conceived of an overall very advanced level of technology that we think it would make sense for this to exist in, they didn't extrapolate out what it would mean to have instantaneous contact with everyone in your social circle just a few clicks away, and how that would shift the kinds of stories that would or would not make sense. So I went looking through a selection from about a century of sci-fi and fantasy to see how fictional communication tech lined up with the real telecommunication communication tech from the era, and how it was used in-universe versus how it could have been used with the benefit of hindsight, and correspondingly how hard it is to suspend my disbelief now that those settings didn't develop the level of interconnectedness we enjoy today. As mentioned, in 1914, L. Frank Baum wrote TikTok of Oz, which features a wireless telephone that allows audio communication over any distance. As a bonus, Queen Ozma also has a magic picture that basically works like a fantasy crystal ball, letting her see anything from anywhere but with no sound. This is a huge deal, but it's actually pretty manageable on the suspension of disbelief side of things, because as far as I can tell, there's only two of these wireless telephones, and Ozma is basically the god empress of Oz, so just because she has high-tech toys to play with doesn't mean the common masses would get to use them. Oz doesn't have a robust telecommunications network, it's just a panopticon. Now at this point in history, the telegraph and telegram system was pretty well established, and wired phone lines were several decades old, but the two-way radio had just been invented, so the vast majority of real-world communication tech relied on people either basically sending letters or being physically near their specific phone when it rang, but it was understood that radio-style portable communication tech was technically possible. Real telecom tech took several leaps forward in the 30s and 40s thanks to a little thing called World War II, which really did a lot to encourage the development of tech that had let people communicate even if they weren't in a specific known location, which in dense military terms is known as bad. Walkie-talkies were figured out in 1936, and the very first mobile telephone service was invented in 1946, functioning based on VHF radio. This was technically the first zero-G network. Network. Of course, this didn't mean mobile phone tech was publicly available, it just meant cell service technically existed. This is around the time we started getting more long-distance communication in fiction. In 1952, This Island Earth featured a device called an interocitor that allowed for instant video and audio communication across interstellar distances, but it was also framed as an incredibly advanced bit of technology, and the main character being able to build it signaled that he was worthy of getting roped into an interstellar war. Our old buddy J.R.R. Tolkien wrote Palantirs into The Lord of the Rings in 1954, allowing long-distance 
scrying as well as communication, but requiring some magical finagling to work. Palantirs are also ancient relics of the First Age and are very rare and very powerful. And the vast majority of Middle-earth operates on a much more low-tech space where signal fires are the height of telecom technology. Isaac Asimov got in on the video call Specfic game in 1957's The Naked Sun, where a culture of pathological introverts live their lives in total isolation from each other, assisted by armies of robot servants, and they get their human communication in by viewing each other through holography. Real-world tech was taking another gradual step forward this decade, as pager technology was first patented in 1949 and developed over the course of the 50s, mostly used in hospitals until the release of the first personal pager in 1962. It couldn't send or receive calls or messages yet, but it could notify the holder that someone was trying to call them so they could get to a real landline telephone and take the call. Meanwhile, back in fiction land, Frank Herbert's Dune in 1965 envisioned a space future 10,000 years deep, where humanity spread across the stars and continued killing each other in all sorts of exciting ways, with a truly staggering glossary of weapons and political tools. And despite this, communication is almost entirely done through physically transporting messages, relatively short-range radio, and a ridiculous piece of tech called a distrans that the Fremen use for long-distance communication that imprints a coded message into the brain of a small animal that can then be decoded with another distrans from that animal's cry. This is hilarious, and I literally cannot believe that in 8,000 years of space exploration and drug-induced hyperspace travel, nobody thought of a better way to send a text. This is where we start getting into the dubious suspension of disbelief zone. There are explanations we can come up with for why communications tech didn't really manifest in the Dune universe, but there are retroactive justifications for the fact that Frank Herbert didn't think of it. It's fine. Speaking of hilarious, 1965 also saw one of the first installments of Larry Niven's known space series, a short story called Becalmed in Hell, where spacefaring characters exploring Venus communicate through radio, and then when they're back on Earth, use telegrams. 1966 was a big year for sci-fi because we got Star Trek. Star Trek's communicators allowed crew members to communicate with each other and the ship, but longer distance communication wasn't really discussed, and since the characters are rarely far from the Enterprise, it's difficult to know the practical range. That said, Star Trek was actually really good about the characters typically staying in contact with each other, or at least having the option to, in large part because it was drawing on the real-world forays into space exploration, where astronauts would rely on radio to maintain constant communication with their ship and each other, since the vacuum of space kind of limited their options. So while the crew of the Enterprise staying in near-constant audio communication when on an away mission seems like a big leap forward, it was actually following in the footsteps of real-world technology, because that's what real-world astronauts were already having to do. On the flip side of things, Ursula K. Le Guin's novel Rokanon's World coined the concept of an Ansible, a device that specifically facilitated instant communication across interstellar distances regardless of light speed constraints. This allowed her to world build a loose interstellar civilization that maintained large scale communication but not small scale contact on a personal level, so her characters were still mostly operating in isolation or on a person to person scale. 1968 was another big year for sci fi since it gave us 2001 A Space Odyssey, which was neat in a lot of ways but for our purposes is only really cool because it showed us what 1968 thought the future of phone booths would look like. A lot like regular phone booths, but now with video screens. 2001 shows us a brief glimpse of picture phones that allowed for video calls from the orbiting space station down to Earth. The character uses a public picture phone booth for a small fee, but is clearly calling a personal picture phone in his house. This mirrored a bit of real tech that AT&T would try and fail to launch in 1970, innovatively called the picture phone. Basically a corded phone with a small television screen on top, and presumably a camera built into the chunky top part of the screen. It was a very popular idea idea that video calls would be the telecommunications staple of the future, but the hardware just wasn't where it needed to be to make it commercially viable for general public use, and of course if the person you were talking to didn't also have a picture phone there was really no benefit, so it flopped pretty hard. 1969 was an even bigger year for sci-fi because it saw the real, actual moon landing. This is a great milestone for humanity overall, and an even better milestone for us because it involved a whole lot of long and short range radio transmissions. It was a huge inspiration for sci-fi writers, and it highlighted the growing understanding understanding that, on a theoretical interplanetary scale, radio was a less than ideal method of communication. Because radio waves are a form of light, therefore radio is limited by the speed of light, and thus even just going as far as the moon produced a delay of 1.3 seconds. Even the sun's comparatively short distance of 8 light minutes meant that going that far would make instant audio communication impossible, and it would prevent mission control from helping the crew in the event of a time-sensitive crisis. A single transponder was all that was keeping the lunar module in contact with mission control back on Earth, and the communication was spotty, 
possibly because the computers running the whole thing had less oomph than a TI-84 calculator. And whenever the command module orbited behind the moon, it lost all radio contact with the Earth because the moon was in the way, temporarily making astronaut Michael Collins the most isolated human being in the universe. In short, while it was definitely the coolest thing our species has ever done, it signaled why we'd need to be a lot higher tech before we could practically speaking get any farther. This would encourage sci-fi writers to develop spec fic technology that could expand on the current level of communications technology and account for this weakness, similar to Le Guin's Ansible, something that would allow for that kind of interstellar communication without that sort of delay. Amazingly, a pretty good indicator of where communications tech was at in the real world can be found by watching Columbo, which began in 1968 and technically ran up till 2003. As the villains of each episode are typically extremely affluent, many of them have access to real-world cutting-edge technology that's often instrumental to their murder plots and their eventual capture, making some of these episodes borderline techno-thrillers, featuring everything from an interconnected landline phone system in a government building in 1973's Candidate for Crime, to a cutting-edge fax machine in 1990's Agenda for Murder, to a high-tech pager that allowed short texting in 1990's Columbo Cries Wolf, and finally a cell phone in 1994's Butterfly in Shades of Grey, where Columbo spends the first part of the episode lamenting his confusion of these newfangled cell phones, and later catches the killer in a lie when he claims he made a 911 call from the road outside his mountain home, an area that Columbo confirms has no cell coverage. But for most of the series, communication is landline only, and when Columbo needs to make a call, he typically just turns up at the killer's palatial estate and amiably borrows their home phone. Just like in the real world, even if more advanced options did exist or were being developed somewhere, they weren't common until the late 90s, and they didn't start infiltrating the way we perceive normalcy until even later. Another surprisingly useful indicator is, of all things, D&D. Dungeons & Dragons is a full-on fantasy setting with a very broad magic system with pretty loose parameters for what is and isn't possible, most of it based around things players would want to do. And if you're a fan of actual plays like Critical Role, Dimension 20, Nadpod, <coughs> Rolling with Difficulty, you might have noticed players using and abusing things like the Sending Spell, first introduced in 2nd edition in 1989 that allows a caster to send a 25-word message to anyone they're familiar with anywhere in the universe and receive a 25-word response. This sounds relatively harmless until you remember that this includes people like dramatically absent parents, missing or captured teammates, the full-on big bad, anyone from the player's tragic backstory, and, you know, anyone they've ever met. Modern actual players will use this spell and other similar abilities to stay in touch with each other when the parties split, which is probably what the spell was originally intended for, and then they'll use it to harass NPCs they like, to fish for information, to check in to see if someone's still alive, and to overall make the game world feel remarkably readily accessible, even perhaps a little bit small. And whenever this happens, there's kind of this vibe, you know? This feeling from the DM, like, well, that's what those spells are for, but somehow I didn't realize it could be used to solve that problem so easily. And if you check earlier editions, it's pretty clear that facilitating telecommunication was not a priority for the designers, or presumably the players. Its first edition, AD&D, came out in 1978, and I combed through the spell list looking for anything that would let the players communicate with each other over long distances. I found three things. The message spell, which lets a caster whisper a message that travels in a straight line to the person they're pointing at, so its long distance applications are very limited, the magic mouth spell, which programs an object to grow a mouth and state an up to 25 word recorded message when a condition is met, and a DM's guide only rule set about magic mirrors and crystal balls that allow for one way scrying, basically just so the bad guys can spy on the good guys because AD&D was basically just stealing everything possible from Lord of the Rings, so of course they wanted to put in Palantirs. 1989's AD&D second edition came out six years after the first commercially available cell phone and added a couple more communication options like whispering wind, which let the caster send a message to a location, not a person, so basically like calling a landline phone, Magic Mirror, which let the players get in on that crystal ball scrying action, and Messenger, which let the caster attach a note to a willing tiny animal. All these methods of communication were very limited and one way, except for the new 5th level wizard spell Sending, which as mentioned allowed a 25 word message and response to and from anyone the caster was familiar with. Since the material component for this spell is literally two cans connected by wire, we can safely conclude that this is indeed intended to be the magicification of a garden variety phone call. Sending stayed on the spell list through editions 3, 3.5, 4, and now 5, with its true potential apparently only being explored recently. It's not like any old joke can cast it, but it's common enough, long range enough, and difficult enough to block or intercept that it can undercut a lot of classic dramatic concerns. And it really seems to me like nobody thought of this application for it until recently. Other abilities that could do more flexible, long range communication first started appearing in the early 2000s with 3rd edition, like Rary's Telepathic Bond, aka 
psychic group chat, sending stones, magical artifacts that worked like paired walkie-talkies but could only send a 25-word message once a day, Mindlink, a psionic ability that allowed for wordless long-range communication, and honestly just a whole bunch of other random wacky abilities that can break the game in new and exciting ways. D&D is a very high magic setting. The potential for this stuff was always there, but it looks like it only started to make sense for people to use it this way recently. Heck, now players will even use those artifacts for a lot more communication than rules as written technically allow for. Most parties just use sending stones as unofficial cell phones now, instead of them just casting one 25-word message per day, which is all they can technically do. And most DMs don't stop them, because it just makes sense for them to work that way. Now, the 90s overall seem to have been a slightly transitionary period for fictional communications tech. Some stories jumped way ahead and made it really easy, while others seemed a little bit slower on the uptake. Ghost in the Shell came out in 1995, and every main character was a cyborg who could effortlessly chat brain to brain with each other across long distances, or use the same abilities to eavesdrop on other people's shenanigans, which makes sense for a story that's fundamentally exploring the nature of connection and isolation in relation to humanity. But 1997's The Fifth Element, set in the 23rd century, kept all the phones as functionally landlines despite the receivers being small, cordless, and handheld. It's a running gag in the movie that the protagonist's mother keeps somehow calling the nearest phone wherever he goes, a joke that only makes sense if the phones themselves are not portable. That same year, Earth Final Conflict started airing, set in the near future, and everyone in that show has a handheld collapsible picture phone. Again, just a slight extrapolation into the future, where video calling technology would surely sweep the globe. The world was getting more interconnected, and it was showing through in the stories it made sense to write. But we only really start noticing that when we compare it to the spec fic that came before, that didn't have this invisible context, this normalcy that was slowly taking form. We wonder why science fiction writers didn't think of this stuff sooner, because it seems so simple to us. Of course we can just send a message instantly to anyone we know anywhere in the world, and of course they can respond as soon as they see it. And if we suddenly can't do that because of bad internet or no reception or a tech failure, we feel weird and constrained, almost like a phantom limb reaching on reflex and finding nothing there. As one of the youngest millennials, I grew up alongside the last stage of development of modern computers and the modern internet. When I was very little, computers had successfully miniaturized beyond giant room size, but were still boxy, clacky numbers with almost no processing power. And the internet was a wild west of cool math games and nitrome and I can has cheeseburger and five million tiny fanfic forums that we were, of course, not allowed to access in class and therefore definitely never did. And every few grades, the school upgraded to a new set of computers to work on, starting with those smooth, translucent, fruity 2000 iMacs and eventually moving up to those shiny white plastic iBook G3s. My school had policies against kids carrying those newfangled iPods, no matter if they were the old version with the circular scroll wheel, or the tiny iPod shuffle with no screen and no buttons, and a couple of the really fancy kids with really fancy parents even got Blackberry phones later in the game. The iPod Touch and the iPhone came out when I was 11, and they completely changed the game. Smartphones were the new hotness, everything was now touchscreen or bust, and everyone I knew was getting one. By the time I hit high school, the official rules had slackened a little, kind of out of necessity, because at that point almost every kid I knew had a cell phone and a parent behind them insisting they keep it on them for safety reasons. Because it turns out, it's really convenient for a parent to be able to always contact their child. So the school ruled that no phones or iPods out in class, but they could be used at lunch or on a break. Meanwhile, in the background, cell coverage got broader, screens got higher res and much less breakable, social media began to take form and encourage a lot more online communication. Texting had been integrated into cell phones a while back and was technically still a thing, but secondary apps for messaging also started popping up all over the place. FaceTime was an unreliable mess at launch, but now that so many people had at least one device with a camera, a screen, and an internet connection, the dream of the picture phone finally became a reality with easy instant video calls, to which most people said, could you maybe just text me instead, and moved on. Ah, rip the picture phone, died a thousand ignoble deaths only to be silently and namelessly absorbed into the functionality of every chat room that outlived you. Anyway, by the time I went to college, my friend group that was about to scatter across a half dozen states had an active group chat that kept us in contact in semi-regular video calls all four years. I almost can't imagine how I would have handled the transition without that. The narrative of going off to college that we'd all heard was so centered on leaving home and being alone and, in the more depressing cases, losing contact with your old friends. And with the connectedness we'd all gotten accustomed to, just none of that happened. Heck, when the pandemic hit in 2020, I think everyone was a little surprised how readily the tech we'd built up facilitated things like working from home and distance learning and just keeping in contact with friends and family. But it also highlighted how physically distant a lot of us were from our close friends now, how much we'd been relying on that telecom stuff to stay in constant contact between visits anyway, but at the same time, how unexpectedly tough it was to handle that when we had to rely on telecommunication stuff for all of our socialization. This level of interconnectedness became 
became normal without anyone really noticing, but then we were surprised to notice how much it had changed. Some of the things that we were expecting to be problems, that we were bracing for out of habit, had been quietly fixed just by the shape of the world changing in a way that left us almost unable to conceive of any other way things could be. Fiction is a mirror of reality. It's not intended that way, and that's certainly not all that it is, but one of the many things it provides is insight into the things that the author couldn't see, that they regarded as ubiquitous or invisible or, bluntly, normal. And when we live through a change in what normal is, one of the ways we can most easily notice this is in how old works of fiction start hitting different. Our normal has diverged from their normal, and this shows through in the invisible things. The things the characters don't think of, the principles they don't question, the problems they don't solve, the applications for existing concepts they don't use. Even when writers construct far-off fantasy worlds with completely different rules, or when they explicitly speculate about the future of science and technology that could grow out of our own, there are concepts that are normal to them. Con concepts that are dependent on their highly specific circumstances and lives that they can't see. I made a ton of statements in this video that are strictly based on my life experience, and how my personal perception of normal was shifted by the gradual change in the tech I grew up with. But I grew up in a big city in the US, and went to private schools whose clientele skewed affluent, and I regularly saw the cutting edge of tech become mainstream in my community within a few years of its invention. And nowadays, my work 100% centers on putting stuff online, and some of my closest friends live halfway around the world. I spend a lot of time texting people People, and I've personally gotten very used to doing the bulk of my communication online. My experience is nowhere near universal, and my normal is probably a lot more online than some of yours. But regardless of my many biases that I can only do so much to compensate for when writing this script, this overall shift in the space of fiction is very real and very noticeable. Stories have been incorporating more and more telecommunication magitech and making it more and more accessible for its characters. The level of interconnectivity we now think of as normal is starting to seep into the invisible substrate of fictional normalcy. And because of how central the concept of communication is in fiction, it is changing a lot of stuff. And even if it doesn't stick out too much, we still notice. It itches in our brain a little, not because it's out of place, but because it's too in place. It makes sense to us that our characters should be able to reach out to each other the way we reach each other. It only feels a little bit weird because we're not used to seeing it, and that maybe makes us wonder why we're not used to seeing it. We're used to cracking jokes about how this plot would have never happened if the heroes had cell phones, or God forbid anyone call 911, etc, etc. It's slowly becoming more and more widespread precisely because it's becoming harder and harder to notice. I started writing this script because I caught myself doing this in my own work without thinking. I invented a simple magical message network and gave my protagonist access to it because it made sense for it to exist and be fairly readily available considering the world building I'd already established, and why not do it, right? It'd make a lot of plot points easier for me to arrange. And then I realized that, without even thinking about it, I'd made it a lot harder for myself to write a ton of those nice, comfortable, tropey plots that rely on the characters being out of communication. And then I started questioning where this disconnect in my creativity had come from, why it was so easy for me to create this plot device without even thinking about it, and only then noticing the enormous consequences of introducing that level of interconnectivity into my otherwise largely low-tech fantasy setting drawn from all my most beloved fantasy tropes that were invented back when the cordless telephone was science fiction. This is so weird to me. I, I didn't want this script to be twice as long as my usual ones, but I couldn't get this out of my head. And this is just the main rabbit hole. The fact that social and technological norms invisibly infiltrate the fiction of its era, even if that fictional setting is completely divorced from reality, is a huge hugely interesting space of analysis at the root of everything from tokenized stereotypes to media aging poorly, to how storytelling has always been intrinsically political, to about half the arguments of death of the author. And because we lose sight of what defines normal as it becomes invisible to us from overexposure, it can be a bit shocking when we catch sight of something in the mirror of fiction that's shifted without our noticing, something that we've lost context for, or something that's taken on new meaning from real-world developments, or something we're used to seeing handled or solved in a way that didn't exist when it was written. The world changes. We change, and because normalcy is entirely relative, we don't always realize how much things have changed until we catch a glimpse of what's become invisible to us. Because we're always on those dang phones, you know? <laughs> oh god, I'm sorry. So yeah.